Hello everyone and welcome to another episode, finally, of Feed My Sheep, Earthquake Reports and more. It's been a little while. There's uh, lots going on um, and we're going to get uh, to it pretty quick here. But first, we've added a bunch of practical information on various levels and types of prepping. And you'll find those in the uh, program details at the on the front of the page and on the uh, station front page. Um, our programming should become more regular now and our format is about to expand and add other program segments. So we should be doing live programs shortly. Now if you like what we're doing and uh, oh, if you like what we're doing give us a thumbs up it says. I apparently haven't been saying this often enough, enough recently. Subscribe and share our program with others. May we all feed his sheep. And thanks for joining us. Uh, last time we were on, we were talking about uh, mid-continental faults. And uh, we were looking at the east side of the Rockies, uh, and right through continental North America, there's uh, mountain chains going through the center of the continent. And these actually go down into Mexico. So we're going to have a, a little bit of an expanded look at them first, uh, at this area first, and then we're going to move on to... Um, what's been going on today, and there's some significant uh, activity today that's been going on today. And uh, so this is worldwide, and there's been uh, continental effects in the U.S. So we'll begin with a little better map. This is uh, the United States, imagine that. This is uh, Wyoming here. Yellowstone is about here. Um, and it just gives us a nice view um, through the state. You can see West, West Texas, where there's a lot of activity, is right on the edge of this mountain range. And so we're having earthquakes right in this area. We're also having earthquakes in New Mexico right about here. Um, we're, for the most part, um, skipping uh, Colorado. Um, let's see. I'm having trouble making out this state. I'm not American, so it uh, it makes it a little more challenging. This is Wyoming, and uh, Yellowstone is right here. Montana is right here. Um, we'll move to our next map now that we've had a look. Um, oh, I should explain. Um, this is I partly we use this map because it shows the river systems. So we've been um, about 90% of rivers run in faults, um, major rivers at least, and some of the smaller ones and, and creeks even run in faults. Um, we've been seeing um, New Madrid activity and it follows the Mississippi and this, this is following it up here. And you can see the river system, the Missouri actually takes, goes right up into here. So this is, uh, this is the Missouri here and this is Dagmar, Texas, or Dagmar, Montana, rather, up here. Um, you don't see this well, but just follow the cursor because it's pretty small. This is the Yellowstone River. And this is um, Red Lodge, Montana. Now, Red Lodge, Montana has had the most active heli plot in the world that I know of um, for the past uh, three and a half weeks, since the 23rd of, uh, 23rd of June. So that's, that's getting on a long time. Prior to that, about two weeks prior, uh, Dagmar, Montana, which again is about here. This uh, Dagmar, Montana is 33, 32 through 33 miles from the uh, Missouri River. And the Missouri headwaters are actually up here um, north of Yellowstone on the edge of the Rockies, uh, runs into the Rockies. So the Missouri runs a long ways. Uh, well, for it to have that much activity, showing from Dagmar, and Dagmar was busy a couple of weeks before um, Red Lodge, Montana was. There has to be a very, very active fault. The only main fault um, potential that we know of in the area is the Missouri River. Now, when we get uh, down here, um, Kingsville, Texas, we're going to look at some uh, VLF waves out of Kingsville. And then you start looking at these river systems that come uh, through Texas. Okay, so there's one there, there's another one there, there's another one there, there's another one here, there's another one up here. Um, all of these are potential faults. We, we, I'm not going to say that they are faults. But when you see the activity that is fault-related activity, and then you look at the location of the, of the city that's involved, or the, 
seismic site that's involved, you know there's a fault close by. Um, and so there's, uh, there's ma major faults through Texas coming out of the Gulf of Mexico that uh, people are not paying much attention to. They're looking at this new Madrid system and they're, they're looking at it mainly in this area but the new Madrid goes right to the Gulf of Mexico and the seismic activity shows that it actually swings up into uh, touching Lake Michigan, Lake Ontario and out Lake Erie, um, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario anyway. Um, and there's uh, there's been activity in Michigan right uh, right under the um, thumb of the mitten. So there's there's been incredible activity up all through this area. This is a big splay fault system. So it's like roots of a tree. You've got the main root coming up here, and then all these finer other roots. We get a, a track of earthquakes all along. This is the St. Lawrence Seaway here. Um, we get earthquakes all along this area. And then if you get to the outer part of the craton, we get um, earthquakes following this area here as well. Um, so this is the Appalachian Mountains, and this is the uh, eastern edge of the craton, right along the Appalachians. So there's a lot of faults. So the earthquakes are not just following the craton edge. They're following faults that are associated with the craton edge, but they're also following the river systems, and there's plutons and there's, there's huge big land masses that are associated and they're very ancient. Now if you take the western side of continental, um, well of North America, and you have it locked up for hundreds of years, which it has been, um, and then what, what's happening is all of North America is trying to move into the Pacific. So with that, um, with the western side locked up, all this builds pressure. Most of the faults you can see follow most of the river systems and they're mainly north-south trending. Well if you squeeze the eastern side against the western side it's going to put immense pressure on these faults. It increases the friction of the faults and so they don't move easily. We saw this happen with um, with the Juan de Fuca fault system. Um, as soon as the volcano started filling up um, all down the western side of North America and that's what the seismology says uh, we watched this uh, progression um, over the last three years um, mainly the last two years and when that happened the force flow we used to see earthquake force come down from Alaska and shift into North Vancouver Island on the Juan de Fuca fault system where the Explorer plate connects. We'd see faults offshore of uh, north, um, north, the north end of Vancouver Island and then we'd see that transfer through to uh, faults in um, or earthquakes offshore of Oregon, occasionally offshore of Washington, and then that would work its way around the base of the craton that would come into California typically and here and work its way around and through. Um, and we'd follow that around. And this was a, a pretty predictable process. Um, once this, once all the volcanoes here in the Cascade Range and in California here um, started reactivating, that system basically shut down to a trickle. So we didn't get the force transfer that we were before. Well, what's happening is this one got locked up. The, the Juan de Fuca that's out here, it got locked up by Western North America pushing into the Pacific. And that's what uh, North America does. It moves southwest, uh, west southwest into the Pacific. Um, this is proven by GPS measurement. And now that allows, takes pressure off of these faults, and it also takes fault pressure off the New Madrid. It also takes pressure off the western side, and all of the, these areas are now having earthquakes. And I believe the reason for that is that this whole section here has been allowed to move to the west, west-southwest, um, which relieves pressure. If it reduces friction, then the faults move more easily. Now, on top of that, we've got the Earth having an unusual uh, physical pole tilt towards the sun. It's got a wobble. Um, and uh, this has been described on other channels very well. Um, and we've got the brown dwarf involved uh, causing uh, significant uh, pole shift, uh, magnetic pole shift issues. We've been tracking uh, 
pole shift changes um, as much as uh, 15 degrees. Just over a couple of uh, three days, it'll change by 15 degrees. So that's, that's significant. So let's move on. This is just showing you the extension of the craton, how it drops. This is showing the elevation changes on this map. Um, this happens to be a fishing map showing George's Bank and Grand Banks, but it uh, showed good color changes for the uh, height differences. And so you can see the elevation remains low through here, and the mountain range continues down through here. And we're having earthquakes in this area right down to here. So now we're going to see some of the volcanic activity. Now, if you have faults, you're going to have volcanoes. And if you have volcanoes, you're going to have faults. Um, even Yellowstone has faults associated with it. So this is uh, Volcano Caracitos. Um, this is 22 miles northwest of Monterey, Mexico. And I did a, a real zoom in on this one. Um, this is all hardened magma, basaltic magma. Um, and this is an outer ring here. This is part of a, a lava field, but this is the most pronounced one. Um, so this is the outer ring. This is an area that's uh, filled in and then cooled. It's dropped and then it's filled and it's cooled and it's filled and cooled. This is more recent here. It's darker, it's blacker. Um, so this is a repeatedly active um, caldera, essentially. Um, probably not that much different from Kilauea, except it's got a different uh, location and source. Now that's uh, 22 miles northwest of Monterey, Mexico, and uh, 50 miles north of Caracitos is the uh, volcanic field around Guadalupe. And this is not the Guadalupe Mountains, but the uh, near the town of Guadalupe. And here you can see a clearly defined volcanic feature here. This is the town of Guadalupe here. These are all volcanic features. You can see the the ripples um, in the ball in the uh, magma here. You can see the the flows of of the magma just frozen in time. And now we're going to move, this takes us uh, up to uh, West Texas. This is the uh, West Texas border with Mexico. Here we see a volcano on the Texas, or on the Mexico side. This is a small volcano here. This is a part of a volcanic field. And this is part of the same volcanic field. Um, and we're looking at some pins up at the top. These are uh, Dagger Draw and uh, other areas uh, north um, that are, have been very active that I've pinned. So I've pinned the seismic locations anyway. So a very large magma field. Now this is uh, this is the field on the North Mexico side. I did a zoom in on it. You can see the uh, crater here, they called it, and a small cone. You can see all the volcanic features. There's another uh, caldera there on top of a small cone. Another circular feature of uh, caldera here. This is an expansive volcanic field. Um, it's just littered with volcanics. We can point out all kinds of them, but uh, let's move to Texas, the Texas side, which is the um, Christmas Mountains. Now, I just want to see a Oh, I didn't record the size of this. Um, I believe this was um, something like 2,000 square miles of volcanic field. Um, I, I'd have to go back and check. It's a huge volcanic field anyway. This is the Christmas Mountains, um, Texas side. And uh, this is Christmas Mountain down here, I think. Um, anyway, volcanic features, um, rising cinder cone. It's old, it's discolored red. There's a lot of iron in magma, so it discolors red as it uh, erodes. Um, both, um, um, basaltic magma is blacker, darker. Um, 
the mineralization uh, over time it, it shows itself red and sometimes just stays black it always changes this is Turlinga just uh, just off to the east so you know where we're at or off to the west sorry so you know where we're at if you want to go have a look for yourselves now we get up to Demings we saw this on a previous episode this is uh, moving north and this is an old volcanic feature, quite well eroded. Now, I said this was activity today. This is uh, activity on the 13th. And this is how busy it was in the Dagger Draw area. So we're seeing a lot of activity. This is pretty normal for Dagger Draw. Um, a lot of unreported earthquakes, and, and just all the time. There virtually isn't a day that isn't this busy. Now the Cornudas Mountains are also involved. So we're working our way north along that mountain edge. Um, when you see volcanics, you're going to see faults. And uh, I, I did check to see what faults are there. There are a lot of recognized faults. They're not recognized as being connected all the way south down to Mexico. So they're, uh, they've got partial distances of faults, just like they do with the New Madrid. They don't show that it uh, connects up through the St. Lawrence River, but it does. These are volcanics uh, north of Santa Fe. You can see the cones in here. Um, this is just north of the Valles Crater. There's also um, volcanic features on this side. You can see the small pimples of cinder cones down here, essentially. Not very technical to call them pimples, but there you are. Um, this is a little closer look at some of those volcanoes north of Santa Fe. You can see they're, they're quite distinct, quite easily identified. And so we're continuing to move north. Um, this is northeast Colorado lava flows. How do we know these are lava flows? Well, partly we know from the mineralization, the iron is showing through coming out of these. Just as we saw red in the cones, we're seeing iron um, leaching out of the magma. We see it over here as well on the side. We'll take a little closer look. I turn the, uh, the view sideways for this and you can see these are lava flows. Clearly defined. Um, it's like a, it's it's the lava flow frozen in time. You can see it was uh, it was building on top of each other, stacking up along here, and running down from this angle. I've I've flipped it around. North is over here somewhere. And now we're looking at uh, Snow King Mountain. We're up in Wyoming. Um, this is Yellowstone right in here, and this is Red Lodge, the most active seismogram not just in North America but the entire world, world that I'm able to find. Um, just incredibly active. I suppose if we got um, one from um, some of the volcanoes that are in other parts of the world, it might be as busy. I'm not saying this is a volcano um, going off. There's a uh, the uh, Yellowstone River runs right along here. And so it's very close to Red Lodge. I think it's picking up the fault activity from under the Yellowstone River. Snow King Mountain is a reactivating volcano as well. It's very clear on seismograms. And so it's on the other side of Yellowstone. You cut uh, directly across Yellowstone and uh, we've got Red Lodge Red Lodge on one side and Snow King Mountain on the other. It's about 100 miles in between these. And just having a look at where Monterey is, uh, Mexico. We're down here. This is uh, a magnitude 3.1 that we had. And again, we're following this. Um, this is the Big Bend Desert in this area. This is that volcanic field is right in here. This is West Texas. Now 
And here we had uh, this earthquake was a magnitude 4.2 on the 12th. And uh, this is Valles Caldera. This is a big volcanic feature. And this is Santa Fe right here. These are the uh, volcanics we were looking at up close. So this was uh, San Simon Sink on the 12th. Not a big deal. Shows a small earthquake. It's not close. This is what happened on the 13th. Big change. This is fault shift activity. Um, and it's how many hours? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hours plus some of major fault shift activity on at a site that is normally very quiet. Now, back on the 14th, I just wanted to bring this up because this was unusual. This is Playa del Rey in California. Uh, it, this is a big, big, striking big change in activity. This was normal activity at Playa del Rey up top here. And I've been watching Playa del Rey um, pretty much daily for years now, well, over a year. And so a big... Um, big increase. California is not staying the same. It's getting worse. And along with it, uh, just a snapshot of California. This, this is State Street, and it's always the most active site in California. And this is from a magma channel that runs under LA. This is north of uh, Long Beach, uh, something like 20 miles. Now, from today, these earthquakes, um, there. I didn't. I didn't focus on the location of the earthquakes. I focused on the size of the earthquakes. And um, we can see that there's a large S wave with this one. We also see a large S wave here. Now I'm going to have. I'm going to shift down to look at a different one at the bottom just so you can see the size. This is how that er those earthquakes look from Wrangell Island, Alaska. And we'll get back and I'll blow the other ones up. So Wrangell Island, oh, that's a long ways north. So you can see they're both pretty good size earthquake with pretty earthquakes with pretty good size propagation. Now the largest of these I believe is called a 5-3. Um, while we're in the area, this is how it looked from Hardware Ranch in Utah. So we'll go back up to the top and have a look at these earthquakes. If I can get this to work, there we go. I'm techni technologically challenged. Aha! So, here we are. We've got a large waveform. The F S wave continues up to about here. This is about uh, three and a half minutes long, something like that. Um, I wouldn't include this portion at the back after the gap. It looks like there's an overlap of another. These are mainly series event earthquakes. So I'm looking at this from uh, a little bit of a distance away because we've de developed a P wave. And uh, then the first deep signal, very deep signal, and uh, and then the surface S wave. Um, this is getting close to a six five. Um, this one here is probably close to a six two. So the uh, downgrades continue from the agencies. Um, these are you can see from the uh, size. This is uh, this is Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, you can. We can always go by the uh, information up here, but I, I know this is the first one I loaded. This is how it looked from the Solomon Islands, and we're a little bit closer. So one of these was in Papua New Guinea. I believe it's the first one. Um, but there were other earthquakes as well. You can see this was also a large size. So there, um, with distance, with propagation, you see they both propagate a very large signal. So these were good-sized earthquakes. They were both uh, six... Uh, this one, the second one is maybe a little smaller, uh, maybe a 6.4, 
the other one's about a 6.5, maybe a 6.6, six, 6.7. Six, six, I'm typically a little bit on the conservative side. This is Sakhalinsk, Russia. Now, why are those earthquakes interesting? Because they're not that big. Um, why did I post on them? Not because they're a big threat to uh, society and life or can they cause a tsunami or, or anything like that, because those, those are not issues. But here, Sakhalinsk, Russia, is at the north end of, um, of Japan. And here we see distant VLF waves associated between the two earthquakes. So this created a disturbance that carries on for three hours um, in Sakhalinsk. Interesting. There's some significant force involved if that's going on. Here we see Hanover, New Hampshire. And leading into this earthquake series, we have a set of very large off the chart VLF waves. We're having major fault movement in Hanover, New Hampshire, or as seen from Hanover, New Hampshire. And uh, this is a bit of a VLF wave going in. And coming out of the body wave of this activity, we see more. VLF waves, very low frequency crustal waves. So we've got um, associated fault shift. This is actually distant VLF waves when you see it uh, tied to closer VLF waves. These aren't huge, but these are distant. Um, you can't tell by um, the height of them how much activity you have. All you can see is that it's farther away, and being farther away, it's going to drop the amplitude. In this case, you could see very far away, getting a little closer here. Oh, we're picking up, getting closer, getting closer. Oh, here, we're right at the site pretty much now. And here's what is actually going on. And then it gets further away again. And it's moving um, down the fault. And we see it appear in here. We see it coming out of the earthquake here. So we're getting near and far fault shift activity that lasted for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven hours. Doesn't look like a lot because we, we look at this large waveform, but there's actually about eleven hours of intermittent fault shift activity. That's big. Bigger than most people realize because um, this is Weston because um, Heliplots are not nearly as sensitive as most seismogram types. They can take a, a real licking and stay online, where um, other seismogram systems are far more sensitive. So when we're seeing a more robust system having waves that are off the chart, it's significant. So this is Western Massachusetts, and this is an hour later that it started after Hanover. Um, the other one started at uh, 1300 on the 1300 line. This starts on the 1400 line. Um, this is all, um, I, I believe there's a volcano reactivating in the area, so we have um, a combination of volcanic and fault shift. How can that be? Well, because volcanoes are commonly associated with faults. So their fault, volcanoes are fault related unless they're um, strictly tied to a plume. Um, there's even faults associated with the Hawaiian Islands. We've tracked VLF waves uh, through to Kapapa, Hawaii, and uh, another site. I can't remember the name of it. So we'll go back up to the top here, because I had things a little bit out of order. There's Sakhalin, there's Hanover. So getting later in the day, we're looking at 1400. Uh, no, this is right in the same period. This is earlier and later. This is how things look from Waterville, Maine. So we see distant VLF activity throughout here. Something's going on well in the distance. This is probably 50, 60, 70 miles away that this is coming from. And then it gets close. And you can see it building and getting closer. It's a little bit larger, a little more numerous through here. Now it's getting larger again, and we're very close to the site where this activity really gets going. And we're looking at how many hours of nonstop activity right through these earthquakes. So this activity led into um, the Philippines earthquake, 
um, Philippines down to um, Papua New Guinea area, um, so South uh, South Pacific activity, and uh, we've got a North American. Um, is it a reaction to the activity, or did we have a force that's so great that it's affecting both areas? I will present to you that it's a big leap to get from the South Pacific to continental U.S., and this is not directly related as in one causing the other. We've got a massive force that's causing both at the same time. They're too far away to be um, shoving each other within hours. Um, this, this is not a related shoving back and forth. This is a related force being applied to the earth and both areas being susceptible and reacting. That's a big deal. As far as I'm concerned, I was talking about uh, places in Texas. Well, here's Amarillo through the same period. You can see there's some distance ac activity. We've been seeing these small earthquake activities, uh, little blips in Al Amarillo before. But today, between the two earthquakes, what did we see? We see one period of massive off-the-chart VLF waves, a second period here, a third period here, um, very significant, lasted uh, over an hour on this line. Each line is an hour on these size, or on these helipods. So all of these areas reacting at much the same time. This comes in a little later. This is um, Wisconsin. It's uh, near Bowdoin and Sunny Slope Roads. It's the jewel farm of Wisconsin, USA. And I can pull up a map and show you where that is. But we're all the way up north in Wisconsin. I mean, we're, we're a long ways north. So we've got a major fault running through Wisconsin. Now, people are not expecting that. But you don't get this activity um, without there being a fault. This is VLF activity, and it's almost high enough frequency to be a major earthquake right in here. But since it's a slower pace, it's not felt as heavily. I'll bet this was felt, though, in Wisconsin. Probably not reported, because um, VLF wave shifts, or crustal shifts that are shown as VLF waves on seismograms, or heliplots, um, are typically not reported as earthquakes. They're big earth shifts, though. I mean, how long did this last? For a better part of an hour. And it wasn't finished on this side when I took this image. So that was uh, earlier today. Now, I thought I'd show you Red Lodge because it just continues to be so active. Like I said, it's the most active seismogram in the world that I know of, um, heliplot at least. And remember, like I said, uh, heliplots are a very robust um, instrumentation. And for them to be, um, for this seismogram or heliplot to be knocked around the way it is and showing all this activity, and it's, it's rightfully recording this. It's not, uh, this isn't a tool flaw or some, something going wrong. This is what's actually going on there. Um, many days in the past uh, three weeks, you can you can see any activity because it was so black. You just got a few strips of vertical light through the seismogram. It was so busily writing. So we had other activity as well leading into this. Um, so I just thought I'd show you. This is a hardware ranch in Utah. This is Haley, Idaho. We had some VLF waves through here. And we already looked at Western Massachusetts. So we're looking at very, very significant plate shift activity. Um, we're going to be coming back with another program segment. Um, and it ties in all of this plate shift activity with uh, some prophecy coming from Amanda Grace. And we've got other information of, of great importance coming from around the world. So we're going to uh, do another program segment coming up, and we'll be back with you shortly. So I look forward to that. So I want to thank you all for uh, joining us. I hope you found this interesting. 
Um, we haven't really tied it together in a big package yet, but we're going to do that pretty quick. Um, but it's showing you that there's an awful lot of information um, when you when you put it together in a big picture, what's going on in one area and it actually does relate to another area quite distant. Um, that should raise your eyebrows a little bit. There's big things, big earth changes are going on right now. Um, so good to be aware. It allows us to be, be uh, mentally prepared. Um, we're not looking at anything huge coming up on the very new, near future, but uh, things are building towards some major activity. And that's also included in Amanda Grace's prophecy, which includes, among other things, a worldwide earthquake, and um, that includes plates shifting. So you should be aware of that. So we'll get into that in the next program. And we'll close with a blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for protecting this program, for leading us to do this program. We thank you, Jesus, for being present to be the Great Shepherd um, directing us. And Holy Spirit, we ask for that you bring the, the spirit of peace, um, peace that passes understanding to the audience. And we thank you for all that you continue to do for us in nurturing our faith in many different ways. We pray that everyone receives a blessing of peace and understanding tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next on our next episode segment of Feed My Sheep, Earthquake Reports and More. Bye for now.